Today we're going to conjure up some cheap tricks. And look at five must-have cantrips for spellcasters in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. <laughs> Greetings, mages. My name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. And today we're taking a look at five must-have cantrips in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. These fundamental spells are so useful that even the mightiest archmages and the greatest hierophants would do well to remember the lessons learned as acolytes and apprentices. Now the great thing about cantrips is they don't require a spell slot, so because you can cast them at will, they're viable from levels 1 all the way to level 20 with a wide range of options for how to use them. Now of course most spellcasters, paladins and rangers aside, learn between 3 and 5 cantrips as they gain levels. Many spellcasters are going to select cantrips for attacking or dealing damage against their foes, cantrips such as Firebolt, Eldritch Blast, or Toll the Dead. That isn't actually the focus of our episode today. We're going to be looking at the creative cantrips that don't deal damage and talking about their useful applications in a wide variety of adventuring situations. Because of the list of spells that we've chosen, it's going to be difficult for a single character to have all of the cantrips we list. Unless, of course, you take the appropriate feats or multi-class. Or perhaps a Pact of the Tome Warlock. Just a few things to bear in mind with all cantrips. Remember, cantrips are considered spells, but whenever something references the level of a spell, it's considered zero. Some cantrips do gain effects as you gain levels, and this is always based on your overall character level and not your individual level in any particular class in the case of a multi-class character. This is kind of a nice perk about all cantrips that if you happen to pick one up as a higher level character, it's just as effective as if you had it from the very beginning of your career. And of course, the cantrips that we list today are our opinion on what we think the five most useful ones are, and they're not listed in any particular order. So with that, let's get rolling. The first cantrip on our list is Guidance. Guidance is a divination cantrip available to clerics and druids, and you can find it on page 248 of your player's handbook. When you cast Guidance, you touch a willing creature. Any time within the next minute, that creature can use... Uh, guidance to roll an additional d4 on top of an ability check. The spell requires concentration and lasts up to a minute. Once the, the creature has applied that d4 to an ability check, the spell immediately ends. This is actually really, really useful in a lot of understated ways. Yeah, adding that little boost from a d4 may not seem like much, but that can tip the scales in your favor in so many different circumstances. The bonus from Guidance can only be applied to an ability check, not to an attack roll, nor to a saving throw. Ability checks are pretty wide open, and these could include anything from making a strength check to break out of a web spell or ropes that are ki keeping you held, or perhaps a persuasion check to convince a shopkeeper to give you a better deal, or maybe even an intelligence check to recall information. It's basically like the cleric going up to someone who's about to attempt a task and saying, May the gods be with you, my boy. I feel 1d4 better already. <laughs> as much as I love the guidance spell, I have seen this get dialed back a little bit in play by some DMs. Like me. I'm notorious as a dungeon master. Quite frequently, I will call for a skill check. And I'll sometimes have my cleric or druid in my party say, Oh, can I cast guidance to affect that role? And I'll be like, Well... I've already asked for the roll. It's a little late for that. Being trigger happy and asking the DM if you can apply guidance after they've already called for an ability check might lead to some disappointments. It really does require a little bit of planning and foresight on your part as a player when you want to apply the guidance spell. And it's best used in circumstances when your party has a little bit of preparation before that skill check is going to come. Remember, you do have a one minute opening to apply that extra d4, so it's pretty generous in that respect. I see it being that sort of situation where it's like, okay, we're going to sneak by these guards, but Buddy here in plate armor is going to have a tough time. I hope that you can be quiet and you cast guidance on him, and now you can go sneak past mm -hmm. and he has that little bit of extra boost on his stealth check. It's like saying, uh, in the name of the gods, be quiet. <laughs> For God's sake, shut up. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like this spell. And I think that over the course of an entire campaign, the impact that the Guidance cantrip can have as a cantrip is pretty massive. 
It's one of the few ways to reliably and consistently gain a numerical bonus to a skill check that isn't already baked into your character sheet. The next cantrip that we have on our list is one of my personal favorites, and that is Minor Illusion. Minor Illusion, of course, is an illusion cantrip. It's available to bards, warlocks, sorcerers, and wizards, and you can find it on page 260 of your player's handbook. Now, with Minor Illusion, you can create an object or a sound. Uh, now, keep in mind, you cannot create both an object and a sound. It's unless, one or the other. Unless you're an illusion wizard. <laughs> That's the one exception. With Minor Illusion, it lasts for one minute, and it actually does not require your concentration. Which is awesome. Which is pretty cool. It has some interesting applications in this way. The maximum size of the object that you can create is no bigger than a five-foot cube. But there's some important limitations behind Minor Illusion that you need to keep in mind. In the text of Minor Illusion, it states that you can create an object. Now, there is a differentiation between objects and creatures. Even though Monty has allowed me to use it to make creatures in the past, this is up to the DM's discretion. And in the text, it does state that you can only make an object. Yeah, the D&D rules do distinguish between objects and creatures. So this is a notable exception, especially compared to other higher level illusion spells, which can create illusions of creatures. I don't think it's necessarily a problem if you allow minor illusion to create illusions of creatures, but bear that in mind that technically you cannot do that by the rules as they're presented in the text. One of the other big points of contention with Minor Illusion is whether or not you can move the illusion itself once it's been created. Minor Illusion doesn't have any text explaining whether or not you can do this, which is in direct contrast to higher level illusion spells like Major Image, which are very explicit under how fast and how far the illusions that you've created can be moved on your turn. Because Minor Illusion does not have any text explaining how the illusion might move, it's possible to interpret it as saying that means they can't move at all. So minor illusion creates a static object only. While this might feel overly restrictive, even being able to create a static object as an illusion at will is pretty potent. And there's some amazingly creative applications that we can yield with minor illusion. This is the main thing about Minor Illusion, is talk to your DM about the rules and restrictions that they want to use at their table. Because it is a cantrip, which means that you can cast it at will, you shouldn't expect it to be as powerful as other illusion spells. It is meant to be a very simple and easy illusion that you can just throw out on a whim without using much magical effort. One of my favorite examples, if you're a fan of the Metal Gear Solid games, is creating a box and hiding in it. This is such a fun use for this spell because you can create a five by five box with minor illusion and just sit inside it or behind it. And creatures are gonna have to come right up to you to inspect that box. They might even pass you by completely, especially if you're moving that illusion right up beside another pile of crates. I just wanna use this to get into the back of some caravan and put myself in a crate. And that's my, that's my stealth sneak in attempt. Yeah, I think that there's so many cool things that you can do here as well, um, like creating the illusion of food to lure a monster forward, although you'll have to be careful about the impact of smell when you're creating illusions of food. Creating the illusion of some treasure is another really effective thing that could be done. Um, I think even the, the use of uh, creating a sound with it, if you have enemies that are on the lookout for you, just using this to divert their attention elsewhere. If they're coming close to your hiding spot and you use Minor Illusion to create a sound of running footsteps or your voice across the room, and then suddenly all the monsters turn that way and start heading in that direction, that's an incredible use of Minor Illusion. In many campaigns, the player characters and the monsters are fighting over an object and creating the illusion of that object in a combat encounter where you as the player characters have possession of it can be a great distraction. For example, if you're trying to bring back the magical artifact to safety, you could create the illusion of it sitting on a table when in reality your rogue has it hidden 
inside their pants. There are so many creative ways to use Minor Illusion. I actually keep a little notepad where I've written down a ton of ideas on how to use Minor Illusion in cool ways, and I look for chances for those to come up during my campaign. I think it's an outstanding spell and a really creative one. Just be sure to know what your DM's interpretation of the rule t rules text are. The next cantrip on our list is Mage Hand. This is a conjuration cantrip available to bards, sorcerers, warlocks, and wizards, and you can find it on page 256 of your player's handbook. Now, like Minor Illusion, there's a lot of DM discretion when it comes to the uses of Mage Hand, but generally speaking, it creates a spectral hand that isn't invisible, that you can move around the battlefield um, up to 30 feet away from you, and as an action on your turn, you can continue to move it. You can lift objects up to 10 pounds, you can pull switches, open bottles, or otherwise manipulate things. I think that it's important to remember that Mage Hand is a visible spectral hand, because that does play into using it to spook creatures, or steal objects, or sneak away with certain things because it is clear that there is some sort of magical, supernatural thing affecting that object. I don't know why, but I always picture that it's a purple hand. I don't know why it's always purple. But for, for me, it's always kind of like a shiny, clear hand. That's how I, I, I picture it. like a purple, like, yeah, see-through hand that just picks things up and moves them or around. Or the, uh, the master hand from Smash Bros. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there is one distinct question that comes up very often with Mage Hand. Uh, which we do need to discuss, and that is, can you do damage with Mage Hand? The spell is very explicit. The hand cannot attack, activate magic items, or carry more than 10 pounds. In addition, it cannot move more than 30 feet on a turn, and it can't exist more than 30 feet away from you as the caster. It does require your action to manipulate it. So using the hand to try to deal damage or to cause effects can be very, very tricky, but it might be possible depending on the situation. For example, the Mage Hand can't pick up a sword and swing it at an enemy, causing damage, but could it pick up an object and drop it on an enemy's head? I've also seen players ask if the Mage Hand can grab a creature or touch somebody or even reach inside a creature's uh, chest spectrally and squeeze their heart. To me, those things all sound like attacks, and Mage Hand can't attack. But the notion of having the Mage Hand pick something up and drop it, or activate something in the environment which could damage creatures, for example, if there's a lever which activates a trap, I think the Mage Hand absolutely can cause damage by activating a trap or pulling a switch, maybe dropping a gate down on something. It can't activate a magic item, but it can definitely pull a switch. And it could also drop a lit torch on a troll. When you are thinking about how to adjudicate how much damage a mage hand could cause, generally speaking, it probably should be in line with how much damage you can deal with a cantrip in general. If someone wants to really use their mage hand to pick up rocks and drop them on people, I would probably only have that deal 1d4 damage, and the attack roll would probably be the equivalent to using an improvised object actually not that effective i think at that point it yeah. would have been more effective to cast firebolt than to use your mage hand to try to do damage but so I, it's very situational yeah but i do like the idea of using the mage hand to hold a torch and start a fire i think that's really creative and really interesting i do love the idea of using mage hand to open or close a door or a gate um or even push uh, or maybe undo a rope that causes a log trap to to fall out it could untie a chandelier and drop it on some enemies that that could be completely possible yeah the creativity allowed with mage hand is really incredible and as long as you're thinking outside the box no you cannot do direct damage using mage hand but there are a lot of ways to manipulate environments and if your dm's created a really nice environment for you to play around in then mage hand can be a very useful tool and the reality of it is is that when Mage Hand is interacting with the environment, it's not really doing anything that the players couldn't already do. The advantage is that it's just allowing them to do this at a 30-foot distance. Next up on our list is Mending. And this cantrip, uh, probably the most useful I could imagine in real life. Somewhat situational in D&D, but when it does come into play, it's a good one. Mending is a transmutation cantrip available to clerics, druids, bards, 
sorcerers, and wizards. So pretty diverse cast yeah. of characters here. And again, I completely agree with you. Mending can be used to repair a tear or break in an object up to one foot deeper long in any direction. And if you think about this in real life, this might be quite possibly one of the most useful cantrips to be able to know in in reality. Because you could use this to fix your phone when you drop it down the, sca- the stairs, fix that hole in your pants and underwear, fix the holes in your socks. Like, all those little nicks and breaks and things that happen in everyday life can all be solved with a mending cantrip. I would only need one pair of shoes. I wouldn't have to buy more pairs of shoes. Actually, when you think about that too, specifically in the time periods that are normally associated with D&D, wearing out your shoes and boots is like the most frustrating and common annoyance of everyday life that we don't think about. And having a spell that can just fix your shoes up for you is huge. So my character should learn the mending spell, retire from adventuring, and just go into the shoe fixing business. Absolutely. I think actually a a character would make a lot of money doing that. Done. Adventure over. (laughs) Um, Um, But for uses in the actual adventure, uh, it is situational. But when it does come up, I've already uttered several times in every campaign, man, I wish I had the mending spell. Yeah, it's kind of that weird thing where like you can use it to fix a broken key or a a snapped lock or maybe repair the damage to a window or a door. I'm even thinking like a bridge across uh, across like a big gap. You have uh, a bridge that one of the sides has ripped Mm -hmm. and it's still there, but the bridge is hanging. And if you can grab that and mend it, you've now fixed the bridge. Yeah, using mending to fix the rope that you cut when you knock the chandelier down. Perfect. And one of the kind of DM interpretation sort of things that I think is interesting about this is whether or not you can use successive castings of mending to fix a larger tear. Like, for example, a cloak, which is usually a lot longer than a foot. If it gets torn in half, is it okay to use the mending spell to fix that? As Probably long as you okay. can, can sit yeah. down and cast it several times, mending a foot at a time. But I could see that going overboard. Like, can you repair a bunch of breaks in, like, a gigantic statue. What if you were given, like, a day to do it? Maybe. The thing to remember is that mending won't cause missing parts in that object to reappear. So you do need the components in order to mend it. Yeah, it's kind of like welding it back together or stitching it back together. It also exclusively works on objects. Although the spell does say you can use it on a magic item or a construct, but it doesn't say if it restores hit points in that way. So that would be subject to DM interpretation again. The other one that I think is kind of interesting with this is imagine your fighter is turned to stone by a Medusa and then she knocks his head off. Well, he would die if you turn them back, but then you could pick the head up, put it back on the statue and mend it back together. Does that work? I would say yes. Now, if, um, if your druid is reduced to zero hit points and ripped in half... Are they still a creature or are they now an object known so as a are, corpse? Are you asking, is a corpse an object? So can <laughs> yeah. you like Frankenstein a corpse that's been named? <laughs> I know that's back a together stretch. Together with the mending spell? I don't know. I, I'm tempted to say yes, but that seems weird to me. Again, I think that if you're using it to re- like repair things, you got to remember, are the body parts still there? <laughs> True. So... Just like most of the cantrips we're talking about today, there is some DM discretion involved, uh, which is why we love these cantrips, because they're so open-ended with your interpretation of them and the way that you can use your imagination to use them. But it is important to know what your DM's kind of lines are for how far you can go with these cantrips. Mm -hmm. I think the really good rule of thumb with mending is, as a DM, it's, is this object broken because it was just snapped or torn? then mending can probably fix it. But if parts of it are actually missing, the mending spell can't fix them. So that's a really good way as a DM, if you want to have like a broken lever, the mending spell isn't going to fix that if the lever itself is missing. The last cantrip on our list is actually a three-way tie because they're so similar. And this is between Prestidigitation, Druidcraft, and Thaumaturgy. These spells are kind of the bread and butter minor magical tricks that are given to clerics, druids, sorcerers, warlocks, wizards, and bards, respectively. 
basically every class has this minor bag of tricks cantrip that's a lot of fun to use, but all of them are subtly different. Uh, just like several of the other cantrips, you can't really use these to do damage, but you can use them to manipulate certain aspects around you. Depending on the one that you pick, uh, there's a lot of differences between them, but all of them generally do things like uh, you can open and close doors, you can set small fires, you can... Uh, with Prestidigitation, I know you can change the way something tastes, or you can clean or dirty a one-foot area. I just love those for so many role-playing and social interaction purposes. I think that the spells foster so much creativity, and I feel like they are must-haves, but they often get pushed off the list of selections for player characters because it's hard to find room for, for these spells and still get your damage dealing cantrips in. I actually, uh, I remember early on in me running uh, Lost Mines of Fendelver in that first goblin cave. Uh, the cleric in our party cast Thelmaturgy to change the color of a fire uh, green. And then another player used Prestidigitation to make, um, I think, like a sound... Or there was a combination of spells that basically changed the fire's color and then made sound come out of it, like a voice commanding the goblins to flee. And the goblins were so scared and didn't know what was going on that they all just ran out of the room uh, before even seeing the, the players. That's so, fantastic and creative. I, I love those kind of solutions, and it really lets the players think outside the box. Another one of my favorite uses of Thaumaturgy was one thing that you did where you were... Uh, you and Josh Elderoon's Barbarian, you're playing a wizard at the time, were in a drinking contest at a bar where you had to drink this vile orcish grog and you used prestidigitation to change the flavor of the beer so that it was easier to get down. And I, I just thought that was a brilliant idea in the moment. I give you advantage on your uh, constant constitution check to drink it because it didn't taste disgusting anymore. Yeah. It allowed us to win some gold in that bar. It was great. Yeah, prestidigitation can also be used to start some small fires, like with torches and and candles and otherwise. Be careful about allowing it to use to start a roaring inferno, but it could, you know, cause some sparks at the very least. Druidcraft is a fun one because it actually has an effect that can throw many dungeon masters for a loop. And that is that it can be used to predict the weather for the next 24 hours. Basically, if there was a, a weather channel in the worlds of D&D, it would be run by a druid who was casting druidcraft to be like, uh, the forecast for the next 24 hours, it will be sunny and clear with a small chance of rain in the evening. I've actually have to watch out for this because our druids in our campaign constantly cast the spell and ask me what the weather's going to be like. And I found that as a result now, I have tables for determining what the weather's going to be clipped to my quick quick reference notes as a dm because so many druids have pestered me with druidcraft has this made you mad enough to rip the druids apart with dragons yes it has yeah we've actually planned entire attacks around finding out what the weather was going to be for the next 24 hours it's it's useful information to know and i love that this is one cantrip that actually influences the world in a subtle way because i think that if you for a lot of dungeon masters, they don't think about what the weather's going to be. And so <laughs> this is almost like a control weather spell in a lot of ways. Because how many times have you as a dungeon master just assumed that the weather for the day is going to be clear skies? And that's always a boring answer. So I like to always mix it up that now when the druid does cast druidcraft, if I'm not going to roll randomly... Give them the thunderstorm. Give them the torrential, torrential rain. That's going to have a really interesting impact on all your encounters that day. These spells are enough of a provocation that a player that uses one of them in a really creative way, depending on the situation, it can merit advantage on something. Particularly social interaction checks. It might give them advantage on a saving throw. Probably not an advantage on an attack roll. But... It certainly can be used in ways that generate advantage. I think that that's entirely appropriate for these cantrips to be creative enough in that way. Because again, it's no more disruptive than the help action. I like I like the idea of the druid um, having a social interaction and presenting a flower that then blossoms in, a, in his, his or her hand as he presents it, giving him advantage on the persuasion check. Yeah, yeah. Or um, just the, the wizard using prestidigitation to give everybody a quick bath so that they look presentable when they encounter the king. 
Or thaumaturgy to uh, give you advantage on intimidation by using that booming voice like Gandalf did when he was talking to Bilbo in the Lord of the Rings movies. Yeah, these are fantastically creative spells. And there's so much so that I'm actually disappointed by how often players don't get to take them because they end up taking one or two damage dealing cantrips, Mage Hand, Minor Illusion, and Guidance. And then these ones get shoved aside. And I think it's a perfectly acceptable house rule to grant these cantrips for free to their respective classes. I I just think that they're so good at fostering creativity amongst the players that they're worth that introduction. Can I can I have press the digitation? So here we've looked at five of our favorite cantrips that we love to use. But there are so many cantrips out there, and we'd love to hear what your favorites are in the comments below. We just picked our top five from the player's handbook, but there are dozens of other cantrips that have been added to 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons that have some pretty awesome and creative uses. We would love to hear about how you've used these in your own campaigns. So this has been our look at the five must-have cantrips in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. We hope that this brings a little more magic to your table. And of course, you can see some of these spells in action as Kelly and I use them in our live play campaign, Dungeons of Drakenheim. The campaign airs live every Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern Time on twitch.tv slash dungeon underscore dudes. Of course, you can also catch prior episodes of the campaign right here on YouTube. And if you want a great feat to pick up some more cantrips for your character, check out our video on the Magic Initiate feat right up over here. And if you just need a refresher on the general rules for spells and spellcasting, we got a whole video for you right over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.